Darkness shrouds the North Atlantic. The year is 1941. Allied ships push through freezing black waves, unaware that beneath them German U-boats lie in wait. Suddenly, torpedoes strike. Explosions tear through the night. But hundreds of miles away, in a quiet hut at Bletchley Park, another kind of battle is being fought. Here, Alan Turing feeds a punched tape into a mechanical monster called the Bombay. It whirs to life, clattering through trillions of combinations. Every tick is a race against death. And then, it halts. The code is broken, the positions of the U-boats are revealed, destroyers change course, lives are saved. In that moment, Turing proves something profound. The future of warfare, of power itself, belongs not just to those who wield weapons, but to those who understand logic. And yet, for all its urgency and brilliance, this wasn't the beginning of the story. This victory through computation was the flowering of an idea far more ancient. To find its roots, we have to travel back, not decades, but millennia, to the very first sparks of human calculation. Thousands of years before electricity, humans were already building machines of the mind. In ancient Babylon, merchants used abacuses to perform calculations vital to trade and empire. Wooden beads on rods, primitive but revolutionary. Then, off the coast of Greece in 100 BCE, a shipwreck revealed something astonishing. A bronze device the size of a shoebox filled with interlocking gears. The Antikythera mechanism. It could predict eclipses and track celestial movements with uncanny precision. This was not myth. It was ancient science. Early computation. Though lost for centuries, these tools planted a seed. The idea that the mind's work, logic, pattern, repetition, could be mechanized. But those ancient dreams, buried in shipwrecks and sand, would need steam, steel and a spark of imagination to rise again. That spark would ignite in Victorian London, inside the mind of a man who saw the future in brass and gears. Jump to Victorian London, 1830s. Amid steam and soot, Charles Babbage builds something radical. The Difference Engine. A mechanical calculator that could eliminate human error in math tables. But his imagination didn't stop there. He envisioned the analytical engine a programmable machine with memory, processing, and input, output. It was the first blueprint for a general-purpose computer. But it was Ada Lovelace, a brilliant mathematician and daughter of Lord Byron, who saw the deeper truth. In her 1843 notes, she wrote what is now considered the first computer program, an algorithm designed for a machine that didn't even exist. But more than that, she foresaw a future where computers could compose music, create art, and manipulate symbols, not just numbers. Ada imagined a world of programmable creativity a century before it became real. Before we continue our journey through the story of programming, imagine if Ada Lovelace were coding today. Would she be sketching algorithms on parchment or collaborating with an AI assistant that understands her logic? This story is brought to you by CodeRabbit AI, a modern tool for developers who want to write smarter, not harder. And if you're working on open source, CodeRabbit is completely free. CodeRabbit integrates directly with GitHub and acts like a tireless code reviewer. It reads your pull requests, catches hidden bugs, and offers intelligent human-like suggestions in real time. But it's not just automation, it's collaboration. It's learning as you build, adapting as you grow. Whether you're refining a legacy code base or launching your next app from scratch, CodeRabbit helps you stay focused on the creative work while it handles the tedious parts. Because the best developers don't just write code, they write it with clarity, intention, and a little help from something smarter. Try it now at CodeRabbit AI and bring intelligence to every commit. Code today may be reviewed by algorithms, but once it was written by hand, in silence, under pressure that few could imagine. And as the world tipped toward global conflict, the ideas of Babbage and Loveless, once ignored, were about to become weapons of war. Their dreams were bold, their designs brilliant, but the world wasn't ready. Their machines would remain unbuilt until the fires of global war demanded their resurrection. The ideas of Babbage and Lovelace faded into obscurity until war brought them back. In the 1940s, the need to calculate artillery trajectories and crack enemy ciphers pushed science into overdrive. ENIAC was born in the US, a massive electronic brain of wires, valves, and vacuum tubes. It could calculate in seconds what would take humans weeks. Yet the true heroes of ENIAC were six women, often uncredited, who programmed it using diagrams, switches, and deep logic. In the UK, Turing and his team built Colossus to break Hitler's toughest cipher. These weren't just engineering feats, they were acts of brilliance in the face of global collapse. Programming had begun, though it still had no name. But ENIAC alone didn't define computing's next steps. Another figure, John von Neumann, would draft a revolutionary idea that data and instructions could be stored in the same memory, laying the foundation for the architecture nearly every computer still uses today. Its first draft of a report on the EDVAC formalized the concept of the stored program machine. It made computers not just fast, but flexible. But machines alone weren't enough. They needed language, structure, a way to think with us. 
The next breakthrough wouldn't come in hardware, but in how humans spoke to machines. After the war, the machines stayed, but they needed instructions. Early programmers wrote in binary long strings of ones and zeros. It was maddening. One wrong bit and the program failed. Then came Grace Hopper, a visionary Navy officer who believed programming should be human friendly. She created the first compiler, a tool that let programmers write in English-like syntax. Her work led to COBOL, a business-friendly language that democratized software development. Now, someone without a math degree could write useful programs. Hopper helped birth not just software, but software careers. She also argued for machine independence, believing that software should outlast any hardware it ran on. That belief radical at the time foreshadowed the portability of modern platforms and languages. And behind Hopper, other women pushed boundaries too. Betty Holberton helped design the first command line editors, and later shaped both COBOL and Fortran. She and Jean Bartik weren't just coders, they were software architects. And as code became more human, it also became more physical. It lived on paper, in punched cards, stacked in trays. But a new operating system, and a new philosophy, was about to rise from the clutter. In the 1950s and 60s, programming was still tactile. You didn't type code, you punched it into cards. A misplaced card could crash your program. Debugging was literal, you dug through physical stacks. Meanwhile, a quieter revolution was unfolding at Bell Labs. Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson built Unix, an elegant, portable operating system. They also created C, a powerful language that could run anywhere. Unix became the foundation of countless systems, from web servers to smartphones. A culture of shared tools, reusable code, and command line mastery took root. It wasn't flashy, but it was powerful. But behind the rise of open tools was also a philosophy championed by a man named Richard Stallman. At MIT, he founded the GNU project, arguing that software should be free, not just in price, but in freedom. His writings and code laid the ethical foundation for the entire open source movement. And while Unix empowered the back end of the digital world, another revolution was brewing, this one on the surface, on the screen. It would change how we saw computers and how we programmed them. Until the 1980s, computers were still walled off used by specialists in labs and corporations. Then came the graphical user interface. Born at Xerox PARC, refined by Apple, the GUI introduced icons, folders, and the mouse. Programming changed too. Now developers wrote code that could respond to clicks and drags. The Macintosh launched in 1984 with a promise, the computer for the rest of us. Programming began moving into homes, schools, garages. From Visual Basic to HyperCard, a new generation of coders was born. People who saw software not as math, but as magic. And when these homegrown coders connected to each other, the result wasn't just magic, it was a movement. One that would redefine programming as a global collaborative force. By the mid-1980s, people could click icons, hear bleeps from floppy drives, and write their first lines of basic in suburban bedrooms. Computers were no longer locked away in labs, they were personal. But beneath the friendly GUIs and colorful pixels, something deeper was shifting, silently laying the groundwork for a future none of these new programmers could yet see. It started with silicon. In 1971, Intel released a chip the size of a fingernail, the 404. Inside it lived a full CPU, something that used to take an entire cabinet of hardware. Within a few years, chips like the Z80 and Motorola 68000 flooded the market. Computers that once cost millions were suddenly within reach of anyone with a soldering iron and a dream. Programmers were no longer researchers in white coats. They were kids in garages, teachers in classrooms, engineers at kitchen tables. Every year, the chips got smaller, cheaper, faster. Moore's Law, they called it. To coders, it felt like magic. Then came connection. While people played solitaire on their desktops, researchers were doing something radical, teaching computers to talk. Ethernet was born at Xerox PARC in the early 70s, and by the 80s it spread like wildfire, first across campuses, then across corporations. For the first time, programmers weren't just writing for a single machine, they were building for networks, systems, communities. The groundwork for the internet was quietly being laid, bit by bit, cable by cable. And behind the screen, data was organizing itself. At IBM, a mathematician named Edgar Codd proposed something strange. What if data didn't live in flat files and weird hierarchies? What if you could query it using logic, almost like language? SQL was born. With a few lines, a programmer could retrieve answers from millions of records. This wasn't just faster, it was a new way of thinking about code. Programmers didn't just control machines, they began asking questions of information itself. But if data was becoming structured, play was becoming powerful. In arcades, games like Pong and Space Invaders took over pizza parlors. At home, early coders loaded games like Zork and Wizardry from floppy disks. These weren't just diversions, they were training grounds. Every sprite, collision, and sound effect taught logic, timing, loops. Kids wrote their first code not in textbooks, but by modding games. By playing, they were learning the building blocks of entire careers. 
And across all of this, silicon, networks, databases, games, another current was forming, a new kind of coder. Not elite, not corporate, just curious. Someone who asked, what if, and typed until it worked. By 1988, millions of computers sat on desks. Local networks linked them together. SQL quietly powered businesses. Young minds wrote code between arcade sessions. The world didn't know it yet, but it was ready. And when a scientist at CERN typed the first HTML tags a year later, everything was in place. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, an open protocol for sharing information across computers. Suddenly, anyone could publish content. The internet exploded. Browsers like Netscape and Internet Explorer brought the web to the masses. But it was open source that really changed programming. Developers from around the world collaborated on Linux, Apache, MySQL, free tools that powered the web. Git and GitHub let strangers write code together. A new ethos emerged. Share your knowledge, improve what exists, build in the open. Programming became communal. And at the heart of it, Linus Torvalds, then a Finnish student, created the Linux kernel. He didn't invent free software, but he made it usable, fast, and scalable. Linux became the silent backbone of the digital world, from Android phones to supercomputers. Soon, open source moved beyond code. Mozilla Firefox became the people's browser. Wikipedia reimagined encyclopedias. The world was no longer just reading code, it was living in it. Each era brought new languages. C++ introduced object-oriented design. Java brought portability and powered billions of devices. Python made code elegant and readable, fueling everything from automation to AI. JavaScript, once dismissed, became essential to the modern web, with frameworks like React and Vue. Then came Go, designed at Google for simplicity and speed. Swift made iOS development elegant. TypeScript brought order to JavaScript. Rust solved age-old problems of safety and performance. Kotlin made Android development expressive. Each language shaped how programmers think and what they build. But just as we were mastering the art of writing code, machines began to write it with us. The final frontier wasn't syntax, it was intelligence. Today, we write code for clouds, not computers. Applications run in distributed containers across global data centers. Infrastructure scales automatically. DevOps, CI, CD, microservices, buzzwords built on powerful automation. And then, there's AI. Not a vision of the future, but a tool of the present. LLMs, TensorFlow, PyTorch. These aren't just frameworks, they're collaborators. Machines now help us write code, debug systems, design interfaces. Are we still programming or prompting? Are we directing or co-creating? The line blurs, but the power remains. Not every revolution roared, some whispered. Between the rise of cloud computing and the birth of generative AI, there were stories that quietly reshaped what programming means and who it's for. While Silicon Valley built unicorns and data centers, something extraordinary was happening around the world. In India, thousands of engineers trained in small classrooms began building the infrastructure of global tech. Companies like Infosys, Wipro, and TCS didn't just write code, they trained armies of developers who now power critical systems for the world's biggest banks, airlines, and governments. In Africa, programmers skipped desktops and went straight to mobile. In Kenya, M-Pesa turned simple phones into financial lifelines, proving that code could leapfrog infrastructure. In Nigeria, Lagos became a fast-growing tech hub. Code wasn't just a Western export, it was becoming a global dialect. And while the world fixated on Linux, Apache, and GitHub, the quiet power of Microsoft Windows and Visual Studio was reshaping everyday development. In basements and classrooms, young programmers learned to code, not in open source terminals, but in colorful IDEs with dropdowns, autocomplete, and step-by-step -step debuggers. They weren't glamorous, but they got the job done. Tools like Stack Overflow turned confusion into community. Editors like VS Code made powerful development free and accessible. GitHub made collaboration a norm. A teenager could now build something on par with Silicon Valley, with nothing but Wi-Fi and willpower. And as AI entered the scene, another quiet shift began. We no longer needed to write every line ourselves. We could describe, prompt, correct, review. We weren't just programmers anymore. We were becoming curators, designers, collaborators. All of this, the global spread, the democratization of tools, the invisible infrastructure, was programming too. And now, as we stand at the edge of quantum computing, bioinformatics, and machine-generated creativity, one truth becomes clear. The story of programming isn't just about machines, it's about people. Ada Lovelace sketching an algorithm by candlelight, Turing racing against time in a war-torn hut, Grace Hopper taping a moth into a logbook, teenagers learning JavaScript to build their first game, scientists using Python to discover vaccines, artists using code to create generative music, and soon, children training AI models in classrooms. From clay tablets to quantum chips, the journey of programming is the story of human imagination. Of turning thought into logic, 
logic into instruction, instruction into transformation. This story isn't over, it's just beginning. And the next chapter? It's waiting for you to write it.